Uh, my focus today is on uh, a period of extensive migration in the middle of the first century AD. I'm going to look at the rural communities of Philadelphia and Tunis as micro-level case studies. So we've got a map of Egypt, and um, again, I don't know the sort of uh, knowledge of Egypt, so I'll just go take it from the start. Um, both of these communities are located in the Fayyum cities, that's only in red. That's basically where all of our papyri comes from. And then we've got Philadelphia in the northeast of the Fayyum cities, and then Tetunis in the southwest. And the current model has this entire period of the used migration as a crisis response to environmental factors. And I'm going to reinterpret this period as one of normal migration, albeit under stress conditions. So, as the model goes, the inhabitants of Philadelphia and Tetunis need to maximize their uh, agricultural productivity to eke out even a subsistence lifestyle. They're living on the breadline, apparently, um, this is high pressure economy and sort of this neo fusing idea, so everyone is using up their resources just to sustain themselves to where they are. And any changes in the environment is going to just um, move them, shall we say. Um, and in Egypt, the productivity um, is reliant upon successful Nile flood. Um, and what that means is they have to hit a sweet spot of being not too high, not too low. And if it is too high, that means it comes early and it doesn't leave at the end, so you can't actually harvest them correctly sow your fields and prepare them, and too low, you're not going to have any irrigation going on. So anyway, in this narrative, a high Nile flood in 1845 resulted in a poor harvest and economic crisis. A Philadelphia, 40% of the population were then forced to flee elsewhere, and then we got famine and disease, finishing off another 20% of the people who were left behind. So this is 60% depopulation, um, significant to say the least. And it's also claimed that the villages of Tetunis are selling their kids just to actually get by. Uh, so nice and dramatic. And then uh, this crisis continued at least into the following decade. So what I've just described represents the broadly accepted model for migration in Egypt. It's suggestive of crisis, of mass migration, and rural collapse. And it's even compared to modern refugee crises. Um, and this model views rural Egypt, Egyptians, as vulnerable to ecological shocks. And again, the Nile uh, is providing the main source of water, so if we can see damage and destruction in one area, we could possibly assume that it's happening elsewhere in Egypt as well. <coughs> it's not that rural populations couldn't recover, uh, because they're growing at around 0.1% every year, uh, the population sizes. So if 20% of the population are dying, this needs 25% to recover, and this is 250 years, so uh, nothing. This model's received some bits and pieces changing, which I've handily covered in red. Um, but there's still loads of issues with this. Um, we've now got some agency and some migration decisions, and then also elements of recovery as well. Um, but crisis events in particular, like this one, are still reliant on neoclassical economic approaches and push pull factors. So we've got ecological shock comes along, and that somehow pushes migrants elsewhere, and they're pulled into greener pastures. But well, it's a really passive process, and no one's actually making a decision about this. It's something that just happens. Um, and anyway, how can you have greener pastures if the Nile flood is impacting everywhere at the same time um, within Egypt? And also, why would my mass migration also dry up these economic opportunities that are available elsewhere? Especially if it's, if it's sort of like this uh, neo Malthusian style economy. It just doesn't make sense. So my inter uh, new interpretation of this event just washes that all the way and we're try and set up this new household and migration model. And this new model comes thanks to recent developments in migration theory and also comparative evidence from structurally similar units in the developing world today. And I'm going to use this evidence to bridge um, where between what we have in the ancient evidence to what we have that's obviously much more extensive in modern studies of migration. And I'm basically just going to argue for a much more robust view of households and communities in Egypt, and maybe also elsewhere in the ancient world. The key points I want you to take away is three, kind of cheating, there's actually five there, but three main ones. So we've got one, migration was a customary method to manage race uh, and normal variations within households and agricultural economies. Two, ecological shocks disrupted households, but they could recover through migration. And then three are the broader implications, kind of cheated a little bit. But so number one, or A, is um, the ability, if most households are able to remain in place while others migrate elsewhere, 
It suggests that villages are finding known sources of work. The other part of this is that it's suggestive of unmet labour demands. There must be job vacancies out there for them to connect to them. Especially if we um, expand our labor definition of labour to include like domestic labour, things around house, care responsibilities, these are so, so important, obviously, even today, but especially then. And I think the most um, plausible explanation for this is that we have significant variances at the micro level. Um, we've got surplus supplies and um, successful households on one side, and then we've got deficit and demand, and maybe even crisis and failure over there, and this is maybe within the same community even. But we've also got random life events, so if your sister dies, you've got to sort of restructure the household that you can't marry her out, so that sort of plans have changed, we need to figure this out. But also, even just if things are going well, um, you know, different priorities over time, if you have a new kid, you've suddenly got to prioritise your resources towards the child. And then I've got then the connections to the labour sources must have occurred through household and community networks, um, and probably also through these big labour, very, very greedy projects that are in the cities and um, estates as well. The most important principle that underlines everything is the work of De Haas, who's a migration theorist, um, and he draws on the liberties and capabilities frameworks of Isaiah Berlin and Amartya Sen. And this principle is essentially that migration is an intensive investment of uh, resources or livelihood assets, um, and the, you can broadly define these as cash, social support, maybe even food. Um, Households in Egypt therefore had to produce and possess assets in excess of subsistence levels to support the household and also invest in supporting migrants elsewhere and then survive them being elsewhere as well. Um, I'm going to show this principle throughout my paper, but this is just a smashing example that I've got to show you off the bat. Um, so this is P. Bill 33, it's a first century letter, uh, and it's where this guy is writing to um, someone else in Alexandria about his dad. It proves my model because he actually has to ask for money so that he can migrate and support himself there. So he says, let him send me a hundred drachmas so that I too can go to Alexandria and stay there for a while. Um, and so from this, the son seems to be struggling in the household while his dad's away. And it's clear that there's a pre-existing connection um, to the recipient of the letter. He knew his dad was going to be there. Um, and it had therefore seemed that both father and son were dipping into their social networks for financial support. Part two. Da, 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 da. Um, I'll now critically analyse this idea of crisis migration. And to do this, I'll establish the demographic trends of Philadelphia and compare them to other data points from other remote Egyptian rural communities. Um, the key things from this is that it's, I'm going to demonstrate two distinctive patterns of migration. Uh, migration volume, sorry. So we've got around 5 to 15% of the population, which I'm going to view as normal, or background or customary levels of migration, and then above 25% of the population, which is indicative of stress migration. I'm going to show these trends through the registered number of adult male taxpayers, migrants, and residents. So just to get that, uh, so I'll have to go back to uh, bureaucracy class 101, if that so exists, for Rome, Egypt. Um, so we've got the registered population, um, these are just the number of blokes that are registered to the village and pay poll taxes there. Um, you've then got the number of migrants, and um, that's the number of epixenoi and anaphoretoi. Um, the Greek, what does it mean? Um, so we've got the epixenos, um, <coughs> they're someone who's eligible for taxation still, but they live in an unknown, sorry, in a known location elsewhere, the tax man knew where they were. We've then got uh, an anaphoretes, and they're kind of similar, but they're living in somewhere where the taxman doesn't know where he successfully evaded the taxman somewhere else, basically. But just to reiterate, that's unknown location to the state. The families probably know where these people are, they're just not telling them. Um, and then the resident population is one line to the other, obviously. And there's loads of other troubles, but I won't bore you with those. Um, so in the context of Philadelphia in the first century, Welcome to my horrific slide of numbers, everyone. Uh, my reconstruction of demographic trends, remember the bar charts, shall I know soon. Uh, of demographic trends of Philadelphia uh, use the Nemesian archive, which is quite a large archive of um, pap uh, papyri that were collected by the tax collector of the village and survive today. 
And then at the bottom, where my head is, uh, we've got P London 25, well, two, the entire thing of two, P London 257, 259, which is three fragments of a census list from Philadelphia. So my reconstruction of this is radically different to what we had before, um, and it indicates long-term stability in the registered population, rather than a 20% massacre. And if you look at the second column on the right-hand side, it's always in the 900s. It's never dropping below that, so it's really not a significant thing. The main reason for this difference is an article from 1976 by John Oates, and he noticed that there were several hundred additional men that have been excluded in multiple um, of the, several of the data points. And so when someone's looked and tried to look, put it on a bar chart, it's going, oh, that's dropped massively, whereas actually it's not at all. Um, the far more influential trend is the volume of uh, migration. Um, so for example, there's notable increases between AD 33 and 36, and then we've got 47 and 49, and then this significant decrease again um, after 49, and this continues to taper off, uh, and it seems to level out at the end of the century. So as I say, bar trap. Um, it's such, uh, these two, two patterns therefore emerge. We've got this 5 to 15%, and I'm counting 22% on the sort of lower end, um, and then 25 to 35%. The former suggests normal levels of migration, and the latter suggests an environment of stress migration. There's massive margins for error in this, so I've got, we're firstly just dealing with men. Um, we're not dealing with women, children, I think, there's, well, I definitely think that there's different migration patterns with them. But also some of these are pretty rough, um, so just keep it in that in mind. So this one's the number of registered people for AD 33. Um, I've followed Anne Hansen's reconstruction, and it's probably the best we're going to do. So um, this comes from an administrative report, uh, actually, and it showed that the amount of text that was collected in AD 33. You can just divide by the rate of tax, but we know that some taxpayers are paying their taxes, so you, you can sort of fudge the numbers a little bit, and it produces these, these sort of estimates. So it's not perfect, but it's what we've got. The bigger issue, though, is this, I've extrapolated estimates for the registered population across some of these data points, so it's going to just smooth this out, whereas there actually could have been some variations in there. But anyway, I think it's still pretty plausible. We have this sort of um, two distinctive patterns of migration, normal and stress. And just to add to this, we've got similar trends in a lot of these other data points from the community as well. So we've got lows that are 5 to 15%, uh, or maybe even 20, and then we've only got one that actually exceeds 25%, and that's from Thebes, that's the one in yellow. Um, so again, these are pretty rough. Um, so for example, the data point from Ivion right at the top, we know that there were 27 of these Anaparetai migrants in maybe 57, 56, but we don't know the number of registered men. Um, so we can sort of apply Ken Hansen's idea, um, because we know that a certain, a certain amount of tax was collected from a nearby village a decade before. So, you know, we can sort of blob it together um, and sort of divide by the rate of tax again. Um, and it seems unlikely that Ibion was much larger than this uh, neighbouring community. So, despite all these issues, uh, which I have to admit, um, the evidence all points towards patterns of migration that are around 5 to 15%. And then we've got these rarer examples of over 25%. And that's what suggests the stress in the community. And if you look, like these are just not migration crises, uh, refugee crises at all. Refugee crises. So uh, I've been looking at two in particular, um, and the Darfur, Darfur in the early 2000s, and then um, the Philippines after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. These are massive, massive crises where almost well, over half of the population will just leave overnight. Um, it's not as simple as this. Um, and that's not just adult males, that's the whole population. And I think this just reinforces the idea of normal and stress again. Um, these are sort of the same thing, and then we've got crisis migration over here on the other side. So what's going on? Uh, the current explanation of stress is basically abstract, and it revolves around crisis, which I'm hoping that I've shown that that's way up over here. Uh, the big bad scary is making villagers run away, but why and how? Um, and one way to get at the micro mechanics of that. Oh, sorry, I missed that part. 
And one way to get at the micromechanics of that is to start looking at uh, ecological shocks in the developing world that stress communities but didn't completely wipe them out like in these refugee crises. So, uh, and what this will take away from this is they suggest that migration was a customary method to manage risk and normal variations. So the two that I'm going to look at are Sudan in the 1970s and the uh, 1990s, and then this coastal flood in Vietnam in 2007. There's just like really nice studies for them. Um, so what happened in these, uh, in these case studies was that the number of jobs that were available in agriculture, and also crop yields as well, were reduced and destabilized, and these are the primary income sources for agricultural communities. And then what households did was they actively responded by reprioritizing their resources, and then they changed their consumption patterns as well. You know? um, it's almost like these are people and are intelligent and do things. So in Sudan, poorer households consumed or um, sold really important assets like cash, animals, and food reserves. Uh, and some of them even took on loans just to stabilize in the short term as well. And even if this made it more vulnerable for the next crisis of, uh, uh, or the next stress exam, um, ecological shock over the hill. And in Vietnam, the desire to migrate increased because the perception of risk at home uh, outweighed the perception of risk in potential destinations. It's all about the human part of it, it's not just um, external. And then as a result, households with enough resources to support a migrant, especially if you've got enough labor, if you're a large household, um, you can invest in migration. These, these people then worked, um, maybe found jobs, maybe um, took on loans wherever they want, and then sent this back, um, and this relieved the stress of at home. And then just to reiterate that, it's that we've got, it's not um, big level things going on, it's people. People are doing things to relieve their own stress at home. <laughs> and then in other studies of rural migration, we've got internal household factors that are influencing migration as well. So this is like a theoretical diagram, this is from an organisation called Foresight, I've sort of adapted it a little bit, um, but it's, just, it's quite nice. So those that are least likely to move are those on the right hand side, um, and that's because they have more resources and more land and more social support. They had a lower perception of risk at home, even if a shock happened. The opposite is also true, the most likely to move are those with fewer resources. But then on the left hand side, and the arrow is too big, but it sort of, it sort of applies anyway, and yeah. uh, we've got a small number of people who are trapped and they're not able to make decisions to move, they have to stay in place. So when stress uh, migration happens, it's actually migrants from poorer households, but not the poorest. So it's sort of a, a lower 25%. Let that percolate. Keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to try and apply some of these trends to um, Philadelphia and other table statistics. Um, so we've got the spectrum, and what I want you to take out of this is that we're going to find similar trends. We've got a spectrum of decision and household capabilities in which some households failed, but most endured. It's not a crisis for the overall village. Um, and the reoccurring trend is that migration was the customary method to manage risk and normal variations within household and agricultural economies. I'm sorry, I have to keep repeating that. Um, but the, so the important data set for this table is that um, it's the evidence for the poll tax, arrears at the top, and then the dike tax. Um, it's, it's basically we can track it. So every adult male in the village had to pay these taxes. Um, so any changes in the arrears would actually indicate um, the prioritization of resources by households in the village. And what's cool as well, I mean, anyway, you can compare it to the migration volume numbers we had before. You put it in, and I'll put it in this table just to keep it really nice and tight. Um, so, step one, it's probable that we've got uh, this high flood that occurs in AD 45, and that's the first black band. Based on what we saw in Sudan and Vietnam as well, uh, this resulted in economic disruptions and food insecurities. Um, after this, uh, we've then got half of the um, villagers defaulting on their dike tax, and then a smaller number defaulting on their poll tax. It's possible that a low flood then occurred in 1846, and that's the second black band, so two successive ecological shocks. Um, and over the next year, most of the villagers defaulted on their poll tax, and half defaulted on the dike tax. 
but then still we've got normal migration volumes. Remember, actually few people died at this point and most of them survived, so they clearly had enough resources to make it through this summer, even though they've had two agricultural uh, seasons that were disrupted. And it seems likely, I, uh, it's kind of funny, honestly, I think, I think what they're doing is just not paying the state taxes and keeping it for themselves, or it for themselves, to, to keep them in place. We've then got many more households that are invested in migration between 1847 and 49, and this has expressed community stress levels. Uh, and at the same time, like, villagers started to reduce their poll tax arrears. And I just can't help but think it's a direct link between this. So again, they're going away, they're working, finding jobs, and then bringing these resources home to help them, to help them pay off the taxes, basically. Um, so the comparative example suggests that local agricultural opportunities dried up, and their perception of risk increased, so that's why they migrated elsewhere and did this, this thing. After this point, the migration levels start to fall away from stress levels, and the proportion of villages in arrears um, falls dramatically. And this is a clearly a successful continuation of household structures, ongoing household and migrant connections, and the regeneration of the village as a whole. And again, it suggests that migration is a customary method to manage risk and normal variations within these household and agricultural economies. That's all fine. It's, yeah, that's fine. But was, this is the micro level stuff, so it's actually interesting now. So what I've just painted is actually way rosier um, image of the period of stress of Philadelphia. It's at this macro level of the village, or medium level, I guess we can call it. But there's definitely a spectrum of impacts at the micro level. So this is a crisis for some, if not for all within the village. And it's also suggestive of significant variations in resources like land and labor, and then again, supply and demand. Um, and then some also probably didn't actually have the resources to be able to decide um, to make these decisions anyway. So the level of mortality in the village is was relatively minor. Um, it was, I think it's probably a maximum of about 7%, but well, it's quite a lot, but relatively minor compared to 20% massacre. Um, but 78% of those who died in, um, in 48 and 49, and 51% of those in 49 and 50 were labelled as without heirs in the tax registers, which is quite interesting. So this is significant for two reasons. Um, the first reason is we know that the Romano-Egyptian inheritance system is really flexible. It's every direction almost. It can go to men and women. Um, and no preference either, but sometimes, but not always. Um, so if these guys are labelled as without heirs, it actually suggests they don't have family to inherit from them. So as a consequence of this, I suggest that the men who were disproportionately affected <coughs> were those without household supportive household structures. Um, <coughs> these were the ones who were the most vulnerable to ecological shocks. The second reason is that some of those without heirs actually did have legitimate heirs. Um, and we know this because we've got some of these examples. Um, so we've got Abbas, he dies at uh, age 51, and he leaves behind his 45-year-old wife, Tapa Pace, and he's got one, at least one child, uh, this son called Horos, um, and he's about 14, I'd say. They're not a completely isolated family. Um, on, based on her age, Tapa Pace's parents were probably dead, um, but they, they, she had at least one extended family member called Adrastos. It's not looking good for him though, right, let's be honest. So what's going on is men who are described as without heirs in this scenario are because their estate couldn't actually cover the debts that accrued on it, so things like tax arrears and stuff like that. So it's either that the state didn't recognise their heirs and just hoovered up their property, or sometimes the, um, the heirs just declined to inherit because it's like, we can't afford to take on the debts. Um, so for this example, at least, uh, the seizure of Atlas's property must have put significant stress on Tarpa Pace and Horos, and made them even more vulnerable in, next time around. And we can actually see Horos as one of these people that are described as migrants without property, uh, and Aporo and Anaparetai, in the next decade. So you guess that he's finally trying to find work elsewhere? Um, but it doesn't help, he doesn't have property because he's been stripped in the previous decade as well. We can't always tell which scenario we're looking at, but it's just certain that the most vulnerable are the ones getting done over in these scenarios. 
And I, the other thing is, I don't think it's a coincidence that almost 90% of those who died in this register from 4849, they can't be identified easily anyway as migrants elsewhere in the papyri from the Nemesian archive. And so these are probably those guys who were trapped and couldn't actually manage their risk through migration. <coughs> so, what I've to be shown so far, to give a little summary, uh, I've got two distinctive patterns of migration, normal and stress, and then also I've got my new model in the case of spectrum of decisions and a range of household capabilities in the ability to even make those decisions. We've got some households failing, but most of them are just enduring, they're getting through the stress periods anyway. And in part three, uh, I want to drive home my new model of migration. And this is that migration was a customary method to manage risk and normal variations within household and agricultural economies. One way to show this is to go back to the horrific uh, number slide. Um, so we can just add in all of the ecological shocks that are most likely occurring um, and associated with these events. We've got quite a few. And again, we've worked with a seven at least, and we can actually only identify one of them as resulting in stress migration. That's the red circle, that's Thebes again. But way off on to do the micro level stuff. So I'm going to focus on this AD 90s period and just over into the AD 100s. So we've got a high flood um, in the autumn of AD 90 and then a famine in AD 99, 100. But still we've got normal migration volumes that are underneath that 25% uh, threshold. All while this is going on, we've got the family of Thermuthas archive. Um, and but she's actually from Philadelphia, so you can sort of trace her into the next decade as well. <laughs> and this place archived is a series of letters that are exchanged between Thermuthas, who's migrated elsewhere, and her naval household. And it starts just before this family, and then the, it continues just after AD 105 as well. So it's narrow, but it's really great because it's like it gives this socialized view of migration um, that's occurring within household economies. It's also, it shows the overriding influence of life course events um, and changing familial dynamics and goals. It's also showing regular natal household and migrant connections through letters and travel and exchanges of resources and news as well. So we've got economic exchanges, but we've also got emotional exchanges as well, um, which is obviously unusual for the ancient world. And then one of the most important things is that the connections between the labor and demand are being made through household and community social economic networks. It's also really cool because it's female migration, and I think it's a lot rarer. Um, but that's the discussion afterwards. And also, we've got women taking on a much more active role in households as well when men are absent. So the households have to restructure their labour when men uh, when men when men have migrated elsewhere. So we've got that moves his family in a family tree. Um, they're a fairly well-to-do family, they're multi-generational, they're extended in several directions, and they've got at least nine members. And they're the guys that are in the blue. We've got some possible unknowns, um, I've put those in grey, don't worry about it. We've got lots of people here, uh, I'll take you to go, just trust your guide. Um, <coughs> there's a problem with family trees like this because it excludes so much information, the biggest one being time and place. So in 1899, we've got um, three residential groups. The family is split. We've got Thermuthas and her husband Antonius, maybe in Alexandria, it's just somewhere north of the fire, we're not sure where she is. But then we've got Thermuthas' natal family, um, and then Antonius' mother as well, still in Philadelphia at home. And I'll come back to this. Um, the, the, the letter um, PWISC69 um, shows a lot of what's going on basically at this time. So the Muthas and her husband are just constantly asking their parents for resources and their in-laws as well. They want clothing, they want food, they want blankets, they want shoes, and everything else essentially. Um, and it's clear that Valerius, so uh, that's the that says send them to me through Valerius. It's clear that he's a key messenger and transmitter of resources as well. So I represented him as like light blue here, and then these red arrows going between them. <coughs> 
And then in, uh, in another letter, the Muthus is actually telling off her parents for saying, like, why aren't you replying to my letters? Um, which I guess if you're constantly asking for things, they might actually get sick of that. Um, but yeah, she obviously wants to keep these social connections alive. In 8104, Damuthus fell pregnant and gave birth sometime at the end of the year. And Damuthus' husband, Antonius, he's actually disappeared, so he probably recently died, actually. Um, and in October of 8104, Damuthus' father had just visited her. Um, Valerius is popping over back and forth again, he's bringing resources and exchanging items. And then we've also got Valeria, who's Thermuthas' sister, um, bouncing back and forth as well. And it's sort of sad, but I, I can't help but think this is actually just these are family members coming to support a recent widow, and also she's got a newborn child as well. Um, so we've got new responsibilities of labour um, and job vacancies that are occurring as a result of life events, and these are being fulfilled through family networks. The next one is, this one is really famous, I don't know uh, the extent to which everyone's into the papyri, not sure. Um, but it's a really famous letter, um, and it's really important to get it contextualised that actually within the family. So we've got Thermuthus and his sister writing to a wet nurse, and that's their Muthion just in the grey at the top. Um, and what the, so the, this family life cycle has created a job vacancy, labour demand, um, because Thermuthus now needs a wet nurse, where she didn't before. Um, and actually she convinces or tries to persuade the wet nurse to come to her aid and because she's going to pay her more for nursing her freeborn child relative to the slave girl that she's currently um, wet nursing. She also promises social benefits for the parents, so you've got, you know, you'll receive a higher wage since it's freeborn and you will find amusement for yourself and your parents if you do it. So we've got uh, women playing an active role in organising domestic affairs and then leveraging their economic and social capital. And I think something that's completely missed when people look at this archive is that surely it's important that she's choosing um, Thermuthion from her home village. She's writing them to her home village in Philadelphia. So maybe she didn't actually trust anyone outside of the labour pool within the village. Um, or maybe she couldn't actually leverage her social capital outside of the village. Why would she pick maybe a wet nurse from Alexandria or wherever she is? And then at the bit at the end, uh, she has to, to even ask Thermuthion to bring her some cash so that Valeria and uh, Thermuthas can get home, but once they got stuck in Alexandria. And then finally, um, the, after 8105, uh, Apuleius, the father, he's absent now. Um, and probably what's happened, he's died as well, because in the previous year, then we first wrote home and said, how's my dad? Uh, he's ill the last time he visited, he wasn't looking too good. So I guess he popped his clogs actually now. Um, so I don't think it's a coincidence that Ben Ruthas is returning home at this point. Again, it's this idea of familial networks generating migration. Um, so I think she's returning home to stabilize the natal household. But maybe the other side of that is that the household at home couldn't actually support her being elsewhere anymore. And also in another letter, um, we've got the Muthes starting to manage tax arrangements. I can't remember if I put this slide in. No, I didn't. Um, manage tax arrangements and financial arrangements for this guy, Apollinarius. And it's been suggested that um, that's her brother, but I'm not sure. Um, so either way, households are restructuring their labour, and women are taking on a pretty active role uh, in the absence of their male relatives. The archive showing a very uh, socialised view of migration and life course events are driving supply and demand, and thus migration. And connections to labour are being made through household and community networks. And if we think like a community, if this is just examples of a, um, one household within a community, this is just one wheel being turned. These are all, there's lots and lots all within the same community going on. So you must have like, this is supply and demand, it's supplied here, or oversupply, and then you must have demand elsewhere in the village as well. In other examples, like this one, um, this is going to be the Patolas and Ptolemais household. Um, it seems to be a much more economic style of migration, um, but it doesn't need to be mutually exclusive, it's just sort of where the evidence leads, so they probably are going on at the same time. I'm totally cheating with this one, because this is going to come from the period where, uh, so I won't talk about, but it just provides such a lovely segue, I have to do it. Um, so these guys are identifiable in the 1870s. 
Uh, and in May 175, um, things are looking pretty positive actually. The household is large, um, it's 16 people all living in the same house, it's a busy, busy house. And they're possessing lots of property as well, including that many <laughs> slaves. Um, and it's centered around two brothers, or at least they're some of the most important characters. And this is Patolas and Harpocrats, number one and two. What's interesting is that the brothers are actually rarely in the household this time, and we can see that in the um, Christ Patrols, which I did in my chapter, and they were migrating elsewhere. So they're probably trying to find work elsewhere and relieving pressures at home. And then at the same time, we've also got these two guys uh, who are absent soldiers, uh, Valerius and Sempronius. I'm going to treat this like long-term migration because the army's not going to let you go home soon, but you can still send cash home as well, so that's going to be helpful. So even so, it sounds okay, but it's not all smelling of roses, because even if this is temporary, um, the migration of Ptolemais and Harpocrats required an internal restructuring of labor. So Ptolemais is the only adult to care for a young daughter, an elderly grandmother, conveniently both called Vettia. Um, and then we've got a similar situation with the kinswomen um, who live in this household as well. And the soldiers, whilst they're away, can't protect them. Um, and you can't protect their female relatives, and this includes another young girl called Thakiaris. So because there's no men, and they seem to be getting on okay, we have to assume that women are taking on pretty active roles here, um, whilst the men are away. So just sort of the final part of the presentation is about Valerius and Sempronius being, no, we, we know that they're in the army. But where are Ptolemy and Harpocrats and many men like them going? And the Philadelphia material, right at the start, provides an indication of this. Um, so we've got two really nice data points, um, 8046 and 47, and the 4849. The former is, get my head out of the way, is uh, normal migration volumes, and the latter is stress migration volumes, to 17 and 34. A crisis one right at the start is suggesting that villages are getting thrown everywhere, we've no idea where they're going uh, or why. And the, but this doesn't make sense because the Nile affects everyone. But in, at least in these periods, uh, sorry, in these tables, everyone's just going local and rural. They're not going elsewhere. They're really sticking close by. So if this is in the Fayum, Fayum's I think maybe like 10 miles wide, um, which is not far at all. But surely this isn't going, is, is it more? I don't know. Is it, is it more? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, so this, but it's surely undergoing the same, it has to be undergoing the same ecological conditions. The local opportunities cannot be drying up because they're going there. And when it suggests that work must be being able to be found all of the time within the local agricultural economy. It's highly unlikely that we have a neo-Malthusian high pressure economy. They're not living on the breadline, they're not living right on the edge of their resources, they're finding ways to find work. What the bloody hell is it then? Uh, the Thamuthus archive suggested that work um, could be and always was uh, able to be found within social networks and household economies. And this is what I interpret as unmet labour demand, this generation of um, job vacancies. They're not randomly drifting around the landscape. There's clear connections being made between supply and demand. And then there's lots of micro variation between and within households and communities. And this must have accumulated into macro level um, variances as well. Again, supply and demand. The other avenues for labor demand must be these ginormous imperial and later private estates. So we've got the um, Heroninus archive, um, which is just hundreds and hundreds of papyri. This is from the second and third century, yes. And um, we've also got, um, so they must be going there or somewhere near like that. We've also got like random bits. So we've got these hamlets that are attached to these states. And some of them are, are, are described as hamlets in the first century and then later re-described as villages, sort of like a bigger independent community as well. Um, so this is even maybe showing like a population dispersal or even population growth. Um, but then we must have these big, big, hungry um, projects in cities and at Alexandria. Um, and these are being generated through local beneficence or temples and constructions and imperial benefactions as well. 
But again, these are known sources of work. We've got deliberate decisions being made to mitigate risk. So just to wrap it up, we've got uh, migration was not a last resort option, and rather it was a customary method, a coping strategy. So manage risk and normal variations within household and agricultural economies like ecological shocks. And then these conclusions are likely applicable to elsewhere in the ancient world as well, 